Well, good morning. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to Trinity Church this morning. If you're here uh, and you're a regular attender, it's awesome to see you and be here to worship together. If you are a visitor, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, this morning, uh, we have a quick announcement that our Christmas Eve service uh, this year will be virtual, so we will not be meeting in person. We will be doing it online. Uh, and so the details of that, the way that's going to work is it will be posted live at 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve. And then so you can watch it then. If you're not able to watch it at 5, uh, once it has run its course and then it can be archived, you can watch it later then. So if you normally come to the 7 o'clock service, you want to watch it at 7 because that's when you always do it. Uh, you can still do it that way. Uh, and, or if you want to watch it at 11 o'clock in your pajamas before you go to bed. Uh, something like that, you can do that as well. Um, but because of the fact that we just can't predict how many people will be here and all of those things and be able to social distance adequately uh, when we don't have those ideas of the numbers and things like that, we are just going to continue to go, uh, we're just going to go virtual with, with that this year. Um, that essentially does it for our announcements, but we also, since it is uh, the second Sunday of Advent, we are going to light the second Advent candle. The first candle we lit last week, which was the Hope Candle, we talked about um, Mary and Joseph having their lives uh, interrupted with this message of hope that the angel had, had brought to them about the gospel and what was about to happen, the birth of the Messiah. And this week, uh, the second candle is the faith candle. And we're going to take some time this morning to look at the response of Mary and Joseph to the message the angel brought to them. So we focused on the message of the angel last week. This week we're going to look at similar, you know, the same passages, essentially, but we're going to look at it from a little different perspective. We're going to look at the, the responsibility that was placed on Mary and Joseph to follow through and to walk uh, in faith the path that God had laid out for them. So uh, we have that coming up here this morning. So let's go ahead and say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for today, the opportunity to be here, Lord, uh, the opportunity to worship you. Lord, we, uh, we take for granted so often um, just the, the freedom that we have. Lord, we are here to, to give glory and honor to you. We're not here to, to do any other thing, to, for, to fill any other agenda or purpose, Lord. Um, we, wanna, we want to just glorify you this morning. And Lord, we ask that you would be honored in what we sing, in what we, uh, as we open your word here this morning as well, and as we take communion. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and you can open to uh, Luke chapter 1. We'll start there. We'll jump over to Matthew chapter 1, then later on. At the end, we'll go all the way back to Luke chapter 2. Uh, but we're going to talk about faith uh, this morning. And so last week, we looked at the message that the angels brought to, uh, to Mary and Joseph, and also to Zechariah, uh, as he learned about the birth of John the Baptist. We talked about the four years of silence and, and all of that, and how uh, the, the world was interrupted by a message of hope from the Lord, and how our lives so often are interrupted by that same message of hope especially when we look around us and we think that uh, things are difficult or, or, you know, we look at and we see darkness around us and things like that. And so that's what we talked about last week. And this week we want to take a little bit of the focus and move it kind of more towards the response to Mary and Joseph and how they, how they reacted to the message when their lives were interrupted by this message of hope, which was essentially the beginning of, of the gospel being put into play on earth. And so... Uh, you know, I started to think about, you know, when you're preparing a message and you start to, you know, unpack things, you start to kind of get into studying, uh, if you really, you start with the starting point of, I'm going to talk about faith, uh, that's kind of, you probably need to narrow it down just a little bit, right? Because that is a pretty broad topic. And so you think about the different definitions of faith and the different, you know, ideas about faith that we have, like, you know, just within the Bible, we have this idea of like a saving faith. The faith that you, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and what that looks like, and that process, and that decision that you make. Uh, we also have this idea of walking by faith, where every day you're making a decision to do what God is asking you to do, and you know, go where He is leading and directing you to go. Uh, you also have faith in, in other people, right? You have faith in uh, objects that, you know, when you get behind the wheel of your car, you have faith that your car is going to go. And when you push the brake, you have faith that your car is going to stop. And uh, when you turn the wheel, you have faith that your wheels are going to turn and all those things. We, we have all these different definitions of faith. And you start thinking, how are we going to get to a, a
you know, operating system on my phone, and that's kind of, uh, you know, their map application acted very similar to MapQuest. It would just pull up on your phone, and there would be the turn by turn. This is when you're going to turn here and here and here. And then I recently switched to a different operating system, and that one has a little bit of a uh, different map system, and it takes about three or four clicks to find that part of it, and it just gives you the, it just tells you when to turn, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that one. I like to know where I'm going. I like to know when I'm going to turn. So, like, I'm going to go someplace. I might not turn for 20 miles, but I want to know what road I'm turning on next, how long it's going to be till I turn. I want to know all those details. And so, for years, my wife and I have had different operating systems on our cell phones. And so, uh, she had hers, and I, I hated asking her for directions when we were in the car and I was driving because she would pull it up and she'd be like, turn here. I'd be like, and? And she'd be like, just, I'll tell you when we get to the next one. I'm like, no, tell me now. I want to know where I'm going. Am I going five miles? Am I going 20 miles? Am I on this road for six hours? Like, what's happening here? You know, six minutes? Just tell me. And she's like, well, I don't know. It doesn't tell me that yet. I don't know how long we're going to be on here. We go until the little thing tells me to turn. And it was a little bit of a source of consternation uh, as we would go in travel places. I like to know what's going to happen. That's the way I am. And yet, uh, our walk with the Lord is more often like the, those turn-by-turn -turn directions when we don't necessarily know where we're going to be until the turn, is, it, it happens. And so, much like that, that system where we know where we're starting from, we're starting from that moment when we place our faith and trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we know where the journey ends, right? We know the destination, and that is eternity with Him when this life is over. And we are promised in Scripture that He is going to get us there safely. He is going to get us there safely. Now, safely might look different to different people, right? Our, our definitions of that are different. The bottom line is He has promised to get us from point A to point B, but there is no guarantee that we will not have breakdowns along the way, that we will not face detours, that we will not face obstacles, you know, flat tires, run out of gas, all of those things. Who knows what might come our way, but the, all we are promised and all we are told is that we are getting from point A to point B and to trust God to get us there. The rest are those turn-by-turn -turn directions. And that's the kind of faith that, that we're talking about here this morning. As, as we st started to think about faith, I was looking up some different uh, views on faith and quotes on it and came across some interesting ones that I wanted to share with you as we were kind of starting this. And One, Martin Luther King Jr. talks about faith this way. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. Well, that, was a, that was a pretty good definition there. Elizabeth Elliot says, talks about it this way. Faith does not eliminate questions, but faith knows where to take them. Uh, Charles Spurgeon talks about it. He doesn't use the word faith, but he speaks to the same idea when he says, our anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strengths. And then I came across, uh, I went to a, a book, one of my a favorite book of mine from several years ago. It's by a guy named Jim Simbola. It's called Fresh Faith. Uh, he wrote three in the series. Started with Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, and then Fresh Power was the third one. Fresh Faith is the one right there smack dab in the middle. It's what happens when real faith ignites God's people. And this is the way he talks about uh, faith. He says, it may not seem obvious at first glance, but the way we make decisions in life tells a lot about the kind of faith we have in Jesus Christ. And that's kind of what we, talk, what we, want, what we want to look at this morning, how we make decisions in life. And we want to use the example that we see from Mary and Joseph uh, on that first Christmas. And so uh, we want to talk about walking by faith. So let's start in the book of Luke, chapter 1, starting in verse 26. And uh, it says this, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give, you, give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son 
And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We read that last week. We talked about the message of the angel. This week, we're going to look at and focus on Mary's response. And we'll come back to that here in a little bit. But in the meantime, flip over to Matthew chapter 1. And let's look at Joseph getting the same message and how he responds. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So there's Mary and Joseph. Uh, we, we see how they are told what's going to happen about the birth of Jesus, the birth of the Messiah. For Mary, uh, the angel Gabriel is dispatched to, to meet with her personally, face to face, and give her the good news. And Mary takes it pretty much in stride, right? I think we can all agree when we read that story, I think if you or I were in that situation, uh, in Mary's situation, being faced with an angel, we might respond a little more fearfully, a little more uh, you know, questions, and she really asks one question, more like the, the how is this going to happen, not the why is this going to happen, but I think a lot of us would kind of be like, why, why me, what, what's happening, and at the end, once the angel departs, you know, or gets done, her response is, is one of just tremendous faith, is it not? She says, may it be to me as you have said, I am the Lord's servant. That's her response, I'm the Lord's servant, let him do what he's going to do, I'm, I'm, I'm here to let him, you know, to have him, he can use me however he sees fit. That's a pretty strong statement of faith, isn't it? And she gets there almost instantaneously. It's right away. She's just like, really, one question. It's kind of, how is this going to work? Because she's like, this isn't, doesn't make sense. And yet he is, you know, she, once the angel explains it and kind of lays it out, and the angel's not giving a long message, it's a pretty short one, pretty straightforward. She says, okay, I'm, I'm good to go. Lord, do what you're going to do. Joseph takes a little bit longer to get there, right? Now, we don't know how he found out about Mary being pregnant, but at some point, whether Mary herself told him or she sent somebody else to tell him, um, Joseph was confronted with the, the truth of the fact that his betrothed or fiancé, fiancé is a little different back then than it is now, but essentially the woman he was supposed to marry was pregnant, and obviously to him it wasn't his child, so, uh, you know, but he was informed that don't worry, the child is the Holy Spirit's child. And, you know, so nothing, nothing happened. It's all good. And you, you can imagine Joseph has probably a, a certain kind of response to that, that kind of truth, if you will. He doesn't probably accept it right away as the truth, does he? Would many of you accept that right away as the truth? Uh, but Joseph, being a righteous man, decides, hey, I'm not going to do what I could do, which was put her to death because of the evidence of quote-unquote adultery, even though that we know the truth and that hadn't happened. But he was looking just at the evidence in front of him. He would have assumed that that had happened, and he had every right to do that. He didn't do that. He decided to divorce her quietly, which would have been, you go your way, I'll go my way, we'll separate, and you, just, you live your life, I'll live my life, and we'll just forget this whole thing ever happened, essentially. And while he is wrestling with this, he goes to sleep one night. He has a dream, and in his dream, an angel visits him and says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For she's told you the truth. What's inside of her, the baby she's carrying is of the Holy Spirit. Now, once again, if you or me, we talked about this a little bit last week. At that point, we'd probably wake up and probably try to examine the meaning of our dreams. We'd probably go see our shrink. We would probably kind of lay it out. We would have our dream journal next to us and all of those good things, uh, trying to make sense of what we just heard. To Joseph, you know what the Bible tells us he did? It says he got up and he went and he did what the angel had told him to do. And so Joseph gets to a, a place of walking by faith pretty quickly as well. It took him a little longer than Mary, but he eventually gets there, right? And so that's what we want to look at this morning. What does that mean to walk by faith? What does it look like in Mary and Joseph's life? And what does it look like in our lives? And so we have a couple of, 
of kind of basic things here and two kind of basic truths. And the first one is that faith, true faith, biblical faith, is based always on reliable testimony. It's always based on reliable testimony. You hear it said a lot of times that, that, that faith is something that you just believe for no reason. That you believe it in spite of all the evidence, right? Have you ever heard faith be described that way? That's not biblical faith at all. Faith, in fact, always goes, you know, is based on solid, reliable evidence and solid, reliable testimony. Now, let's just look at the example of Mary and Joseph for a second. All right? Mary, uh, to her, it was happening to her, so it was pretty straightforward. She had an understanding. For Joseph, it was a little different, right? He's being asked to trust what Mary is telling him. To him, all of the evidence says otherwise, doesn't it? All of the evidence that he says says what you are telling me is a lie. What you are telling me cannot happen. It is impossible, and therefore, I have to only believe and assume that you are telling me a lie, and what happened is something different. Until, until what? Until the angel shows up. Joseph's faith is based on the testimony of that angel, right? Mary's faith is based on what? The testimony of Gabriel. Think about your faith in Jesus Christ. If you're sitting here this morning and you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus as your personal Savior, what is that based off of? Did you just wake up one day and all of a sudden say, Hey, I'm saved! Jesus, yeah! Is that how it happened? No, you, you heard about it, didn't you? Somebody told you about Jesus. They, to they, they told you about the gospel. They witnessed to you. Maybe you were saved because you sat down and you read through the scriptures and, and the, the Bible is the, the reliable testimony. But somewhere along the line, you had to hear the truth, right? And so there had to be testimony. There had to be reliable testimony. In Mary and Joseph's case, the, the, the basis for their faith is based on the reliable testimony of the angels that visited them and told them what was going to happen. Mary didn't just wake up one day, find out she was pregnant, and say, oh, this must be from the Holy Spirit, because it's the only explanation, and he must be the Messiah. So I'm going to be obedient to whatever God wants me to do. No, no, the angel approached her and told her, gave her the starting point, right? And in the same way, we are not asked to blindly follow all right? The Lord has laid out a, a blueprint. The Lord has laid out a, a trustworthy testimony of who He is and what is expected of us, and it's in His Word. By the way, it goes even a step further, and, and we can find that through, through prayer. Jim Symbol in his book Fresh Faith says, We like to control the map of our life and know everything well in advance. But faith is content just knowing that God's promise cannot fail. This, in fact, is the excitement of walking with God. The fact that God's promise cannot fail. You know what God's promises are? God's promises are the trustworthy testimony that we base our faith on, is, is it not? I mean, how many of you can sit here this morning and say, you know what, I have rock-solid, tangible evidence that I can hand over to you that shows you that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven? Doesn't make it any less real if you can't do that, does it? Because your faith is not based on that. Your faith is based on trustworthy testimony and reliable testimony that is found in the Word of God. That's where faith starts. That's what it's based on. It's not a blind leap. There's a, there's a great scene from, uh, the, I, I call it the last Indiana Jones movie because, um, let's all be honest, we really wish they hadn't made the fourth one. Um, but in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, there's a scene as he is searching for the Holy Grail where he's going through the, the trials at the end and the, the traps and the, you know, all that stuff. And, and he goes to this chasm, right? And he walks out and there's this chasm there of just, it just looks like it drops like a mile straight down. There's no way across. And he has his father's journal, doesn't he? And he opens his father's journal. He reads, it says only, uh, something along the lines of only in a, a leap of faith from the lion's mouth will, will he pass or something along those lines. And what does Indiana Jones do? He closes his eyes. He sees the lion's head right there, the statue. He closes his eyes, uh, and he puts his foot out, and he just kind of puts all his weight forward and lets it fall into this chasm, and he realizes that it hits solid ground. He's standing on a bridge that is only visible when you're actually standing on it. Now, I've heard that illustration, that, that scene from movie used to explain faith, and that it's a blind leap. But in fact, that actually proves the, other, the opposite, doesn't it? 
It's not a blind leap. It is, in fact, based on that reliable testimony. What was his reliable testimony in that, in that scene? It was his father's journal, right? He didn't just walk up. I mean, it would be absurd for his character to have walked into that, that room with that chasm and just think, oh, hey, I'll step out into nothing and I'll be perfectly safe. Does that make any sense at all? No, but because of his father's journal and the, and the work his father had done, he had reliable testimony that led him to have faith that if he took that step, it would be the right thing to do. Faith is based on reliable testimony. Faith, uh, in Wayne Grudem, his systematic theology, he says it this way, faith increases as knowledge increases. New Testament faith is not something that is made stronger by ignorance or by believing against the evidence. Rather, faith is consistent with knowledge and true understanding of the facts, and that's based off of Romans 10, 17. That talks about having to hear and then believing based on the testimony that is given to you. Mary and Joseph based their faith on reliable testimony. It came straight from God, from the angels, from the mouths of angels. Maybe you don't have that when it comes to walking with, by faith. You don't have the ability to, to base your walk of faith on that kind of testimony, but we do have ours based on the truths and the promises that we find in the Word of God. It's not just a blind leap going against all evidence. The more you study the Word, the more you see that the evidence proves the Word, not the other way around. And that brings us to the second part of this, is we have to have that foundation of the fact that faith is based on reliable testimony, otherwise why are we doing this? Um, and then faith itself is made up of three basic elements as we start to look at this. And uh, so I mentioned that we have these different definitions of things, and they all kind of intersect together into one definition, uh, and, and this is the same way. They're all faith, whatever kind of faith, it's made up of three basic elements. Uh, the first is the element of understanding, all right? This idea of understanding, basically what that means is there must be some basic knowledge of the facts, right? How can you believe something if you never heard it? We go back to the idea of you didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm a Christian because I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, that he rose again three days later, that he has conquered death, he has conquered sin, he's ascended into heaven, he's promised to come again. Uh, you know, you probably didn't just wake up knowing that. You had to hear it somewhere, right? You had somebody witness to you, you opened the word and you read it from the Bible. Uh, you know, somehow, some way you heard it first. And so the first step in faith is a, an acknowledgement or the understanding of the basic facts. So in saving faith, let me ask you this, is it enough just to know that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? It's not enough. The Bible's very clear. It says that you believe that good, so do the demons, and they tremble. All right, so it's not just simply that. Faith is made up of, of these elements. It starts with understanding. You have to have the basic knowledge. So Mary and Joseph, they got the basic knowledge, right? They were told, each one of them, by the angel, this is what's happening to you. And Mary has that first initial response. She hears the facts, and what does she do? Does she instantly believe? Not quite. It's pretty close. She's pretty close to it, but not quite. The first thing she does is she asks a question, doesn't she? She says, how will this be? Since I'm a virgin. This that, that doesn't work. That, that's not the laws of, of nature. <laughs> um, Gabriel, pardon my interruption, but this is not the way it works. I'm sure she probably didn't relish trying to explain the birds and the bees to the archangel out of heaven. But that, she asks a question. See, she hears it. She has a knowledge of the basic facts of what he's telling her, but yet she, she's still processing it, right? For Joseph, it was the exact same way, wasn't it? Joseph heard the facts. We don't, like I said before, we're not told how he heard the facts, but we know he did. Um, and yet his response was to divorce her quietly, to say, okay, I'm not going to, you know, he didn't necessarily buy into it right away. He wasn't necessarily believing it. But there must be some basic knowledge of the facts first. There has to be an understanding. It, it, you, you're not going to get to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior if you don't first hear the truth of what he did for you on that cross. And so that's the, this idea of faith being based on, reli or on reliable testimony and being made up of three elements. The first is that idea of understanding. Um, you know, as we, as we think about it, there's a quote from Billy Graham that I came across, and I, I mentioned that there's three basic elements to faith. He calls them two because he combines uh, number one and two that I have, as I have them divided into three, he combines the first two. And uh, this is what he says. 
It says, faith simply means believing that something is true, uh, then committing our lives to it. In the Bible, faith means believing in God and in what Christ has done for us to make our salvation possible, and then committing ourselves to Him. In other words, faith has two parts to it, and both are equally important. The first part is belief. Belief that God exists and that He loves us and sent His Son into the world to save us. Faith isn't a vague hope that God might exist. It is a definite belief that what, was, that what the Bible says about Him is true. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him, Hebrews 11.6. Now, if we take that and we, we kind of extrapolate that out and we look at it in our own lives, when we talk about walking by faith, the, the same go, holds true. The first step of walking by faith is having a basic understanding of what God expects of us, right? And the only way to have that is by getting into the Word of God and studying the Word and through prayer. That, those are our connections. Those are our communication tools with the Lord. And those are things that we take so often for granted and we don't utilize enough. But if we don't have the facts, we're not going to have faith. We're not going to be able to follow God because we're not going to know what he's asking us to do. Which leads us to the second one. And I mentioned Billy Graham talks about two. He just uses the word belief. Uh, I've broken it down into two because some other uh, people that I was studying have it broken down into these three parts. And so the first one is understanding, which is a basic knowledge of the facts. The second, which is the second part of belief, as Billy Graham calls it just the one thing, is approval. And what that means is there must be agreement with these facts. So you got to believe the facts, right? you got to buy into them. Not only do you have to know them, but you have to acknowledge them as true. All right? It includes a conviction that the facts spoken are true and also includes an awareness of need. So if we're looking at this from a saving faith type situation, uh, the, the awareness of the facts, the first part, the understanding is the message of the gospel, right? Having heard it. The second step of faith, the second part element of faith is the approval, meaning acknowledgement of these facts is true. Well, I believe, yes, Jesus did die on the cross for my sins. Yes, he did rise again three days later. Do you guys see how that works? For Mary and Joseph, it's the same way. In this idea of walking by faith, we see the same elements. They had heard the truth, and for both Mary and Joseph, it took another step forward to get to this st stage of approval, of acknowledging these facts is true. Mary got there real quick, didn't she? She asks one question, how will this be? The angel explains it to her. She says, okay, here I am. Lord, do what you want with me. I'm yours. She went right to acknowledge. You guys see the, the steps there? She acknowledges right away this is true, and we see her faith being lived out in her life and in her response. Joseph takes a little longer, doesn't he? Joseph's response, it, it takes having a dream as he's weighing and wrestling all these things. It takes him having a dream about what's going to happen, uh, and, and this angel speaking to him in the dream and telling him what Mary has told you is the truth. This is all happening for a reason. God is behind it. And Joseph wakes up, and what does it say? It says he did what the angel had commanded him to do. So he had gotten to that second. He had, there, now we have in both Mary and Joseph that second element of faith, of walking by faith, the acknowledgement, the agreement with the facts. And the, I love the fact that in that definition is the, the inclusion of the awareness of need. Because let me ask you a question. If you were sitting here this morning and I were to tell you, let's say you weren't a believer. You had no idea who Jesus was. And I explained to you the gospel. That Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He lived a perfect sinless life. That, you know, all of these things. That he, he died on the cross for your sins and he rose again three days later. Conquered sin, conquered death. You can have eternal life simply by faith, placing your trust in him. And you were aware and you acknowledged that what I'm telling you, that you believe what I'm telling you is true. The approval part of this, that, that process of faith, it includes an acknowledgement of need. If you were to listen to me and hear me tell you about the gospel, what Jesus has done for you, he died on the cross for your sins, to save you from your sins, etc., etc., all the way down the line, and you are sitting there, and in the back of your mind, I didn't include the fact that all of us are sinners, and we all need forgiveness, and you are sitting there, and you're saying, well, I have never sinned, and in, you believe that in your head. Are you acknowledging your need? Are you going to reach a place of saving faith in Jesus Christ? The answer is no, you're not, because you don't see the need to be saved from something that you don't think is a threat. Mary and Joseph, it happened pretty naturally. I think they're very aware of their need for the Lord when they're being told that this child is the Messiah. 
And that brings us to, to the last part, the third piece of the puzzle when it talks about faith. We have understanding and acknowledgement of the facts. We have approval, the, the agreement with those facts, the, the recognition they're true, and a, and a recognition of your own need. And then let's look at the continuation of the story in Luke chapter 2. And we'll see this third part. In Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, it says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus and all the world that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, many of you have heard that numerous times. Many of you have heard that not just read, read out of the Bible, you've heard it out of the mouth of Linus on the Charlie Brown Christmas special, uh, which coincidentally now you can actually watch on PBS next Sunday at 7.30 p.m. There's my public service announcement. We might have to eliminate that one from the, uh, from the archived version of this sermon. <laughs> but, you know, we've heard it. And it's great. It's the message of Christmas. But I think as we're looking at this definition of faith and what faith is, that take, this simple passage takes on a much more profound meaning, right? Because what did Mary and Joseph do? They made a personal decision to be obedient to what God was asking them to do. The third element of faith is just that, a personal decision. It involves placing trust in the message. It requires action on behalf of the one doing the believing. So it would be one thing for Mary and Joseph to say, okay, you know what? Hey, an angel visited me. An angel visited you too. Wow, that's amazing. And this must be the truth. And then what are we going to do about it? Absolutely nothing. It doesn't make any sense, does it? But they followed through. They were obedient. Joseph didn't you know, know Mary until after the baby was born. He followed through and was obedient to his command. Mary treated this child as if it was her own, and, and he was her own, but you guys get the idea there. And, and, and they went, and they were obedient, and they went to Bethlehem. They followed through on what they were supposed to do. In other words, for them, it was just a fact of living their life. But they were together. They followed through on what the angel had told them to do. In the same way, when we place our faith, we talk about saving faith and this idea of the gospel. Uh, if you guys have ever studied Evangelism and Explosion and gone through the training for that, there's a great illustration, and I've talked about it before, and I've used it before. It's about a chair. And it's about the difference, the connection of, of those, those first two parts, acknowledgement, or, or the first one, uh, understanding and, and approval, the, the knowledge of the facts, and then the belief in those facts, and then that taking it to that third step, which is pers making a personal decision and actually acting on that belief. And so in that process, if you're sharing your faith with someone through Evangelism Explosion, what you do is you get a chair, right? And you set the chair in front of them. You say, hey, this is a chair. We can all agree on that, right? And the person normally looks at you and nods because you're pointing at a chair. It's not a difficult gr concept to grasp. It's got four legs. It's got a seat. It's got a back. You know, that's the thing. And then you ask the question, do you believe that if I were to sit in this chair, that the chair would hold my weight? Most of the time, the answer is going to be yes, because based on just years and years of experience, when you sit down in a chair, you generally expect what to happen. You expect it to hold you up. That's why it's so funny when someone sits in a chair and it breaks apart and they fall, because the look of shock on their face says they were not expecting that. You expect the chair to hold your weight. Why? Because you acknowledge the truth of the facts that it is a chair and it will hold your weight. And then you get to the question, you ask the person, well, why isn't it holding your weight? And the answer to that is because I'm not sitting in it. Well, the chair can't be a chair and serve the purpose of the chair and hold your weight. No matter how much you believe that it can, it won't actually do it until you take that step of faith to sit in the chair. And if you've ever sat in a chair, you know that there is a point of no return, is there not? That as you start to sit, at some point, all of the weight is now transferred backwards, and you are going to go down. And if the chair does not hold you, you are going to go all the way down. 
And so you are placing your faith in a chair every single time you transfer that weight and sit in that chair. And the gospel is the exact same way, guys. The gospel requires a personal decision. Saving faith requires us to not just acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah, to not just acknowledge and believe the facts of what he did for us on the cross. It requires a personal decision to place our trust fully in that message and to say, you know what, I am a sinner, and Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my life, save me from my sins. And you sit in that chair, and you allow the Lord to hold up the weight because it's exactly what he's going to do. Billy Graham talks about it this way. The second part of faith is commitment. A definite decision not only to believe in our minds that Christ can save us, but to put our lives into his hands and trust him alone for our salvation. True faith not only believes Christ can save us, but actually trusts him to do it. The Bible says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's the same way with our walking by faith, is it not? The Lord asks us to do something. He asks us to go across the street and talk to our neighbor, to witness to somebody, to just serve somebody, to love on them, to, to, to provide for them when they can't provide for themselves. Whatever the situation is, we can think of hundreds of examples. And we are called to walk by faith. In the same way, if I sit there and I say, you know what, Lord, I believe and I, I acknowledge this person is in need. I believe you're telling me to help that person, but I sit on my rear end and do nothing Am I walking by faith? No, I have to make a personal decision to follow through and act on what the Lord is leading and guiding me to do. Mary and Joseph did that. They pursued a life together even when everyone around them was going to look at them like they had done something wrong simply because Mary was willing to allow the Lord to use her because she was pregnant. Everybody around them knew that's not Joseph's kid. They were going to live a life together when the looks would never stop. Oh, yeah, that's Mary's firstborn. That's not, he, yeah, he's not Joseph's kid. You know that's true, right? You know that's exactly what was happening. But they were willing to make a personal decision to follow through and be obedient to what the Lord was asking them to do. And you know what? The end of it isn't always what we think. Joseph didn't get to see the end, did he? Joseph didn't get to see his son grow to be the man and start his earthly ministry. We know from Scripture that Joseph was gone by that time. He had passed away. Mary did get to see it, but she also got to see another part that she probably didn't ever want to witness. Jim Cimbala says this, so many, so many times when we get into emergencies and the situation seems totally hopeless, it's actually a setup. God wants to do something great. He wants to demonstrate his power so that his name will be praised in a new and greater way. The next generation will hear all about it. After all, their spiritual nurture is far more important than our material things. Aren't you glad Mary and Joseph had that attitude of faith? That they were willing, even when, and you can't imagine. You might say, well, it was just, she was just pregnant. Understand, her life was over. It could have been physically over, but for all other intents and purposes, it was going to end. And she was willing to stand there and say to the angel, may you, I am the Lord's servant, do to me as you see fit. It seemed hopeless, and yet, why was it that way? So that God's power could be seen in a new and awesome, amazing way, and that future generations would still be in awe. That's why we celebrate Christmas, isn't it? Because we are in awe. It's what Christy sang about when he says, well, I look back in reverence on that holy night. We are in awe of God's power and the way he took a hopeless situation and turned it into something awesome. And by the way, that's exactly what he did when it comes to the cross as well, as we celebrate with communion this morning. You take your communion cup that you've grabbed on the way in. I want you to think about that quote again. So many times when we get into emergencies and the situation seems totally hopeless, it's actually a setup. God wants to do something great. He wants to demonstrate his power so that his name will be praised in a new and greater way. The next generation will hear all about it. After all, their spiritual nurture is far more important than our material things. Isn't that the message of Christmas when it comes to the lives of Mary and Joseph? You know, their, their situation was an emergency, 
They're now not only uh, are they being obedient and in, in acting in faith and following through on what God is doing in their lives, but in Luke chapter 2, when they get to Bethlehem, there's no place for them. And you can imagine that probably felt like an emergency as well, right? As they're going through and Joseph's probably panicking. His wife's about to have a baby and, and there's nowhere for them to stay. It's actually a setup. <laughs> I love that line. God wants to do something great. He wants to demonstrate his power so that his name will be praised in new and powerful ways. That's what was happening. Because the angels were about to appear at the birth of that child to shepherds in a field. A celebration was about to commence that was unlike anything anybody would ever have planned if, they were, if we were the ones planning it. But the Messiah had been born. Now, think about the cross. Was there ever a moment... Was there ever a time that was more hopeless than the, than the cross? Put yourself in the, in the shoes of the disciples. You've followed this guy for three years. You've seen him raise the dead. You've seen him turn water into wine. You've seen him walk on water, calm storms, heal every sickness and disease, cast out demons, you know, make blind men see. And then in one moment, you're there as they nail him to the cross. You don't think you would have felt hopeless? Talk about an emergency? But guess what, guys? It was all a setup. God was setting up something amazing, wasn't he? God wanted to do something great, and he was about to demonstrate his power through his son in a way that will, will blows our minds still today and is the reason we have hope of that destination we talked about at the beginning of the sermon eternity with him so that his name will be praised in a new and greater way and the next generation will hear all about it the message of the gospel is still being proclaimed today take the the wafer if you peel that top layer off and I want you to think about that truth think about the way those disciples felt as they were looking and watching their Messiah being beaten and they would later understand that he took all of that punishment for them. He took all that punishment for me. He took all that punishment for each and every one of us. Do this in remembrance of him. Just as the wafer represents the body of Christ, the cup represents the blood. The blood of Christ that was spilled on the cross, not blood that would cover our sins temporarily, but blood that would wash our sins clean away. But I take you back to that quote. So many times when we get into emergencies and, into situa and the situation seems totally hopeless. Think about Mary. We've been talking about Mary the last two weeks, the mother of Jesus. Now fast forward to the end of Jesus' life as he is hanging on that cross. You know who was right there? Not his disciples. His mom. She was there at the foot of the cross when he breathed his last. You realize that. Can you imagine what it must have felt like thinking back on all those promises that you heard from the angel when you were told you were going to have a child? Thinking back on his birth when the, the sky was lit up with the glory of God and angels everywhere and shepherds are there proclaiming. And then the visit of the wise men and all the things that have happened over those 30 plus years. And then to be sitting there at the foot of the cross watching the blood of the spotless Lamb of God drip down his face and side. John, the only disciple who was with her. You talk about hopeless. But you know what? Once again, it was all a setup. God was about to do something amazing, overwhelmingly powerful, because the blood that was dripping down our Savior's face, the blood that Mary watched dripping down the side of her son, is the blood that washed our sins clean away. Do this in remembrance of him. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the, the truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for allowing us to believe the faith that you have placed inside of our hearts. 
nor do, we're not trying to unpack whose decision it is and get into those theological issues this morning, Lord, but we just simply are trying to unpack what faith is. It's an, an understanding based on reliable testimony, that it's an acknowledgement of the truth of that testimony, and that it is a personal decision to place our faith, our trust in that message. That's our action, just simply placing our trust. We are sitting in that chair, Lord, and we've all done it. It's a decision, as everybody's sitting here, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you've sat in that chair of saving faith, and yet we are being called on a daily basis to put our lives into your hands, Lord, and to walk by faith. Not the faith that determines our eternal destination, but the faith that determines how we live and how we act and what we say and what we do. And do we reach out to this person? Do we do this? How do we do what, whatever you want to put into that blank, Lord? That's this idea of walking by faith. And so, Lord, we are asking for wisdom. We are asking for direction. We are asking that you would use what has been talked about this morning, the example of Mary and Joseph, so that, Lord, the end is simple. Mary and Joseph went. They were obedient. They, they did what you asked them to do. They, they went. That's all you're asking of us, Lord, that we go. Maybe it's across the street. Maybe it's, who knows? But Lord, we stand here this morning. We sit here this morning willing to go. Like Mary, willing to be used by you. Like Joseph, willing to put our plans on hold for what you have in store for us, Lord, because we trust in you. We have faith in what you are doing. And Lord, may we be people who walk by that faith. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we uh, continue to, to emphasize our prayer uh, ministry and our prayer emphasis for the week this week, as we've been talking about faith, is just simply um, expressing to the Lord your, your faith in Him and your trust and your willingness to step out and walk by faith. So whether it's five minutes every morning this week for six days, that gets you 30 minutes, or whether you sit down for 30 minutes today, just thank the Lord for what He's done for us and express your willingness to walk with Him by faith every moment of every day. That's our prayer focus for this week, uh, and we just ask, hope you guys have a great week this week, and remember, as always, you're loved.